novel. So the reading can come before or after. So over to you, John. Uh, miigwech, uh, minoa. It's good to be with you again. Again, I'm speaking to you from Wasanich territory and uh, grateful for this bright, sunny day here and also Lekwungen territory and the uh, Songhees and Esquimalt First Nations and uh, thankful for being in this uh, Douglas Treaty area. Um, I've enjoyed the conversations we've had so far as I've gone through this time together and I hope that this also generates some conversations along the way as well. Um, what I want to do is talk about the context of uh, this issue that's found in this book, um, which has to do with Wendigos. Um, Wendigos are characters that are consumptive um, in sort of conventional uh, popular accounts. They are cannibals. That is, they um, can't get enough to eat and uh, they are on on the verge of starving, but they're also always overfilling themselves. Um, and uh, when uh, settlers came amongst uh, Indigenous peoples, they found um, this um, character quite frequently as they moved across the country. And um, this uh, led some folks in the 1960s and 70s to describe something which is, I think, suspect known as the Wendigo psychosis. Um, that is, Indigenous peoples in certain areas developed a psychosis around the uh, consumptive nature of uh, the challenges that they received. And, um, you know, there's been critique of this point of view, not uh, the least Hadley Friedland, who teaches in the law school at the University of Victoria, and who published a, a master's thesis about the Wendigo amongst the Anishinaabe uh, and Soto and uh, into Cree uh, territory as well. And, and so this, uh, this character though, um, just despite being mischaracterized, um, is nevertheless an important uh, character within um, the law, within uh, Anishinaabe law in particular. And uh, when Hadley Friedland was studying this, uh, this uh, phenomena, she said, you know, in Canadian law, we organize our affairs by contract, tort, and um, property and criminal law, and we try to see what our, our laws are in relationship to those categories. But she said, uh, if I was thinking about uh, Anishinaabe or, or Soto law or Cree law, I might think about uh, Wendigos as a category. And uh, that got me to thinking about how the Anishinaabe were organizing a certain type of uh, legal event uh, under an umbrella term. And then in a book I'll talk about this evening, Laws and Indigenous Ethics, I, I tried to expand that and said in our, our laws, perhaps we would organize ourselves around um, heroes, um, caretakers, um, monsters and tricksters. And uh, that uh, idea of a monster might be the Wendigo uh, theme that's there. So I wanna just uh, put this book in that uh, setting. As uh, Louise Erdrich was writing the book, uh, as I mentioned before, not claiming any um, great uh, insight here, that she led me um, um, read a draft of it. I was teaching at the University of Minnesota at the time, got to know her while I was there. She had been an encourager of my daughter. Um, um, Louise went to Dartmouth uh, College in New Hampshire. My daughter went to Dartmouth College in New Hampshire. They had met earlier, and so we had some family connection as uh, well as professional connection, because she's very close to the University of Minnesota as well. And so I read a draft of the novel and uh, really enjoyed it, of course, but I, 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 I could notice some themes that were there that I wondered if she might just give some further prominence to. And so I lent her a copy of um, Hadley Friedland's LLM thesis, which has now been published as a book from the University of Toronto Press called We To Go Legal Principles. And I'll share those principles with you in a few moments. Um, and, and so she uh, took that into account, um, the We To Go um, Legal Principles, what became a book from Adley Friedland, as well as my book on drawing out law, which I talked to you about yesterday. And uh, there's, a, there's a We To Go story in there. And at the end of um, the book, uh, The Roundhouse, uh, Louise uh, makes mention of this book, Drawing Out Law, and makes mention of uh, Hadley's work on We To Go Legal Principles uh, to draw out uh, some of the things that were in the manuscript already 
and probably just put a finer point on them in, uh, in many respects. But I want to share with you that uh, story that uh, was at the heart of one of the chapters of Drawing Out Law that is also a story that is very similar to about the 30 or so stories that Hadley encountered as she was doing oral interviews uh, with people amongst the communities that she was working with. And so the story I'm about to tell you has uh, a great resonance across a broad landscape of um, Anishinaabe, Soto, and even into uh, Cree um, understandings. And so I'll just share my screen and um, no, maybe I'll read the story rather than share the screen, um, just so that you get a sense of it in your ears uh, as, a, as a result of that. So it's a, an account, and I can maybe share the screen with the um, picture of the person. Here we go. Here we go. Let's see, slideshow. So this is an account of, this, is, this was found in the Jarvis papers which uh, is in the Metro Toronto Reference Library. Um, and uh, William Jarvis at the time was the superintendent of Indian Affairs in 1840, at the time this story was gathered. If you've been to Toronto, you know about Jarvis Street. Uh, it intersects with college at some point. It was uh, when I was going to the University of Toronto, it was the uh, site of LGBTQ uh, sociality and activity. Um, often the Gay Pride Parade went down Jarvis Street. Uh, Jarvis's old house is uh, on that street. It's a, well, at least it was at the time, a beautiful old structure, if I recall that correctly. And, um, and, and yet he was a superintendent of Indian Affairs um, back uh, before Canada became a nation back in the time when uh, this was called Upper Canada. And so it goes as follows, um, his account. This account given by Mayakaming of the murder of an idiot, and that's the word he used, last winter by a band of Indians near the French River during the winter of 1838. So the French River is just south of Sudbury, Ontario, uh, north of Muskoka, Perry Sound, on the eastern shores of uh, Georgian Bay. So this is an account of something happening in that area in 1838. Here we go. He came among us at the very beginning of last winter, having in most severe weather walked six days without either kindling a fire or eating any food. During the most part of the winter, he was quiet enough, but as the sugar season approached, he got noisy and restless. He went off to a lodge and there remained 10 days, frequently eating a whole deer at two meals. After that, he went to another lodge when a great change was visible in his person. His form seemed to have dilated and the face, his face was the color of black. At this lodge, he first exhibited the most decided professions of madness. and We all considered that he had become a weendigo, a giant. He did not sleep, but kept on walking around the lodge saying, I shall soon have a fine feast. Soon this caused plenty of fears in this lodge, both old, um, both old and young. He then tore open the veins at his wrist with his teeth and drank his blood. The next night was the same. He went off out from the lodge and without an ax broke off many saplings about nine inches in, inches in circumference. He never slept, but worked all, all that night and in the morning brought in the poles he had broken off and at two trips filled a large sugar camp. He continued to drink his blood. So that's the, the background here to this case. I'll share more of it in a second, you know, but here's this person that's been amongst the Anishinaabe for about six months. He came at the beginning of the winter and um, he had walked there six days to get there without a fire or food. Right, so this person shows up in a disheveled, uh, emaciated state, uh, um, unusual um, situation. Usually Anishinaabe people would travel together. You would know who was what. Uh, this was an individual coming amongst them. And he was quiet enough during most of the um, winter season. Um, and so that 
indicates to me that they were watching him and understanding what was going on and trying to pay attention to who he was. And they made an observation about the state that he was in. But then as the sugar season approached, he got noisy and restless. So, you know, maple syrup or sap starts to flow in Ontario, um, maybe around this time, maybe a little bit later, end of March, early April, um, as there's a thawing and a melting. So, you know, he's probably been amongst these people five or six months. And then during late, uh, sort of mid-March uh, or so some, somewhat, he, he gets noisy and restless. And then he, he starts um, hunting, needs a whole deer at two sittings. Um, and then he goes to another lodge and then he starts to change in his form. Like he looks different to the people. And uh, he's, he's not sleeping anymore. He's walking around the camp and he's threatening others, right? He's saying, I shall soon have a fine feast. The implication is I'm going to kill someone. I'm gonna eat someone. I'm going to uh, cause harm to others. And at the same time, he's also being um, engaging in self-harm, right? He's tearing open the veins at his wrists with his teeth, and he's drinking his blood. And then he goes out into the forest, and he starts chopping all these trees down, and he brings uh, these saplings in that are nine inches in circumference, right? That could not have been an easy thing to do, uh, and he fills... Um, um, fills the lodge uh, with these with these uh, these sticks. Um, he's not sleeping again, and uh, he's yeah filled the lodge with the with the uh, the broken off sticks um, it, with two trips. So so what would you do if you are a community in 1838 on the French River? Um, there's no um, police around. There's no um, judges. There's no uh, legislative presence. Um, you know, this is an Anishinaabe space. This is where uh, people need to deal with the challenges that they find in life uh, amongst themselves. So now I'll keep reading uh, what, what happens. Um, the Indians then all became alarmed and we all started off to join our friends. Right, so we've got the issue here, which is someone's threatening harm to others and they're, they're being self-harmful. So the issue is, what do we do about this harm? How do we go about resolving this? The Indians became alarmed and we all started off to join our friends. The snow was deep and soft and we sank deeply into it with our snowshoes. But he without shoes or stockings barely left the indent of his toes on the surface. This, this month in Anishinaabe one is called an Onabanegizas which is hard crust on the snow moon. It's hard to walk on the snow at this time of year and you'll break through with your snowshoes. So this would have been a really tough thing for these people to join their friends uh, in this situation, but it was important enough to them to do so. And everyone was breaking into the snow. They were breaking their show snowshoes, but he, without shoes or stockings, barely left the indent of his toes on the surface. He was stark naked, tearing off all his clothes given to him as fast as they were put on. He still continued drinking his blood and refused all food, eating nothing but ice and snow. So here's Anishinaabe law in action, right? Uh, all of this time over this past six months, and now they're in another stage. We then formed a council to determine how to act as we feared he would eat our children. And then the decision, it was unanimously agreed that he must die. His most intimate friend undertook to shoot him, not wishing any other hand to do it. After his death, we burned the body and all was consumed, but the ice, sorry, all was consumed, but the chest, which we examined and found to contain an immense lump of ice, which completely filled the cavity. Just parenthetically, all the stories, most of the stories that Hadley uncovered also had this part of the story where someone's chest cavity is filled with ice. We don't quite know what that means. Um, after, now reading on again, um, after his death, we burned the body, so I got that. Um, the lad who carried into effect the determination of the council has given himself to the father of him who is no more. 
to hunt for him, plant, and fill all the duties of a son. We have also all made the old man presence, and he is now perfectly satisfied. And then Jarvis finishes here by saying, this deed was not done under the influence of whiskey. There was none there. It was a deliberate act of this tribe in council. So you've got the facts of this case in the 1830s and this challenge that they're facing, and then you've got what they did to deal with uh, this issue, right? So, so what are the Anishinaabe legal principles here? There's a waiting, there's an observing, there's a collecting of information over a long period of time. There's a meeting in council with the, their friends when it appeared that something was wrong. And again, that was very hard to meet, yet they felt it was mandatory for them to have this uh, with their friends. They're trying to help the person who is threatening and causing them imminent harm, right? They looked after him for six months. And even during that sugar season, um, there was uh, that uh, care there. And then of course, um, you know, they're still hoping for something, uh, like they don't know what the outcome is gonna be when they gather to get with their friends. Um, and then if the person does not respond to help and becomes an imminent threat to individuals of the community, that person is removed so that he or she does not harm others. Right now, in this case, there was a capital punishment to that aspect. Obviously, the life was taken. That might, and prob that would never be the case uh, today. That Anishinaabe communities would take someone's life. We understand about mental health. Uh, we understand about the challenges of of um, um, depression and uh, you know, chemical imbalances and loss of connection. Um, but in this case, the, the decision was to emphasize uh, the removal of this person. And then you helped those who relied on that person by restoring what might have been taken from them. Right here, the, the, the person that took the life of the man that was presenting as a Wendigo became the son of the, uh, the man whose other uh, son was taken. And he, he, he provides for him. Right? He's, he's left with care. There's a restorative justice element here. And then also the old man is given presence by the rest of the community. And we don't know what it means to say he was perfectly satisfied because you can imagine he would carry great grief as a result of what occurred. And so there must've been some elements of uh, dissatisfaction, but the report here is he was satisfied. And uh, you have you know, both the individual and the collective here participating uh, in this, uh, this restoration that is the community, as well as the, the person that now becomes the son of him who is no more. Um, so that is a principle, a set of principles that is old amongst the Anishinaabe. And I'll just share my screen again. And uh, this is what, Hadley also recorded when she uh, did her LLM research in responding to Wendigos. That is, you generally don't uh, kill uh, the Wendigo, you try to heal the Wendigo, and only would kill the Wendigo as an absolute last step, right? And what we're getting from the report from William Jarvis is really the last step. Uh, we're not hearing these other things, which are having to do with Wendigo legal processes, um, steps for dealing with Wendigos, restorative response principles, legal obligations, legal rights, legal principles. Let me just read some of this here. Um, that if you want decision making in, the, in these stories that uh, Hadley's interacted with, you find that legitimate decision making is collective and open. It's, it's uh, not just done with a fa one family or one clan or one person, right? It's a, here you can see there's one community joining another community and who knows how many communities were in those two that were joining with one another. It's collective and it's open. And the authoritative decision makers are leaders, medicine people, and family members. So there's a lot of different angles of perspective that come into this. So what are the legal we're dealing with? We need to go recognizing the warning signs. Here, this person arrived alone, right? Had this appearance uh, that was disheveled was hiding and there was some supernatural developments amongst that. And, and this correlates with what, with what uh, Hadley found as well. 
observing, gathering evidence to determine whether someone fits the category, and then determining a response. And look at the range of the response here, right? Death is just on the absolute end of this um, and would be uh, an anomaly because what the, what the responses are are kindness. You know, someone's suffering, someone's um, not satisfied somehow and they can't fill that need. Uh, care, questioning, healing. And when I, I told, talked about this story uh, back when I was writing out, drawing out law, um, I, I visited with people in Manitoba and they, they talked about ceremonies that were there to heal Wendigos. And there was a, a lot, like particularly amongst the Swampy Cree, the Omishkigo uh, people, uh, there's a lot around the healing of Wendigos. Um, if, if that doesn't work, then there is a separation. But even there with the separation, there's supervision, right? So there, there's still a care found, uh, but there's a need to protect others that would be otherwise vulnerable if this person wasn't separated. And then banishment, and then finally death. What are the response principles? Here is just uh, making this more explicitly with kindness, uh, healing, uh, you know, hospitality, nursing, medicine. Um, the separation might sometimes be self-inflicted. Sometimes it could be permanent, not always. The incapacitation might be tying up or restraining, again, by a friend, uh, not uh, vengeful. And you can see that there's a responsibility to help and protect, which, which is, of course, linked to the ability of the community. Responsibility to warn the person that's in that state of Wendigo, also to warn others. You know, they, they all went off to join their friends. Uh, there's a warning element there too. And if the person does respond to help in terms of the healing and the questioning and the care and the kindness, there, there's, a, there, there's, there's then a lifelong relationship between the person that was the Wendigo, uh, you know, the person that was suffering from mental health issues, anguish, and those that supported that person. Um, and, and so, there, you know, it, rather than like in the criminal justice system, where you send someone off to prison um, and you don't provide for the family when that person is gone and the judge might never have anything to do with that person again, here these folks are really deeply embedded with one another's lives. Now, there is a, a right that the person that has this indigo um, uh, sense uh, had, that had, there's a right for them to be heard. Um, there's a right for the decisions to be made in relationship to the closest family members. There is liberty and life and safety. They have a right to be helped and a right to ongoing uh, legal support or su support, as I mentioned. And then there's a reciprocity here. That is, those that are helping the Wendigo are also given gifts so they can do the work of helping the Wendigo. And, um, and then they draw in in these contemporary stories that Hadley talked about, um, they're open to using all sorts of tools and allies, like the courts, uh, Christianity, uh, police. It's not like an either or, a pure, you know, untouched, you know, they, they're, they're practical in the way that they're working with this. Now, I want to stress again that Wendigos would not be, um, no one would uh, take another's life today. I'm just going to read from a case that comes out of the Supreme Court of Canada. Um, which is about thinking about the past in relationship to the present. The way to resolve these problems is not to avoid historical analysis, but to make sure that one is looking not just at the existence of the practice itself, but the rationale behind that practice and the principles that underlie it. Right? So don't just focus on the practice that here someone is put to death, but look at the principles that were motivating this community and the reasons uh, underlying uh, those, uh, those principles. And, and then you start to get at uh, Indigenous law, or in this case, get to Anishinaabe law, because now you're in the realm of agency and humans making decisions with complexity, as opposed to just acting in a, a, a autonomy, you know, like an automatic zombie-like uh, way. Um, there's, there's more to say, um, but I think that I've talked for about half an hour and we have a half hour for discussion. But this, this book, The Roundhouse, is trying to explore from this one perspective, Anishinaabe law, as it relates to Wendigos. And so it's a book about um, the application of Anishinaabe law. Now, the way that um, 
Elise and the characters in this book have undertaken this application is, uh, is distinctive and different than some of the things that I've presented here. I'm not gonna spoil it for those that haven't read it, uh, but if you pay attention, uh, you'll see there's lots of these dimensions that are going on as the book unfolds. The other beautiful and brilliant part of the book as well is that she takes up American Indian law, what we call federal Indian law, as it relates to harm. Um, in this case, a, a rape, and that's at the beginning of the, the story. And, and what happens though is federal Indian law is a maze of jurisdiction because the site of the crime takes place where you don't know if it's state land or federal land or reservation fee land or reservation collective land. And, and each one of those landscapes would give rise to a different law and they all intersect right there around that roundhouse, which is related to the Buffalo stories that we talked about um, in, uh, in prior, prior lectures here. And it's, it's a, just a brilliant exposition of, of federal Indian law as it intersects with a tribal court uh, jurisdiction because the, the father of the main character in this book is a tribal court judge himself. And uh, he's charged with trying to take up how you work with law uh, given this crazy patchwork quilt of uh, intervening federal and state uh, laws. Um, so you've got that maze of jurisdiction there, but that intersects with the Anishinaabe law. And the question is, which of these laws should take uh, priority preeminence? And, uh, and it's complicated. There's complications with every single law, and none of them are perfect, including Anishinaabe law. And, uh, and so she's not trying to be romanticized about uh, Anishinaabe law, but she's also trying to say there's something that this law could offer these uh, parties that uh, um, you know, has, has been, been taken up in the, in the book itself. I, I really enjoy uh, reading it. Uh, I, I'll never write a law review article <laughs> that's as good as this. I will never write a book that's as good as this, which means to say that despite all we do in the law schools of writing judgments and helping students to see how they work with this legal system and how it interacts with the parliament and the legislatures, or even how we might create the resurgence of indigenous law and, 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 and facilitate indigenous peoples taking responsibility for their own affairs, uh, a novelist is going to be better at eventually communicating to the wider public what we're doing in our little offices and uh, chambers and, and, and halls of parliament than a law professor could, than even a Supreme Court of Canada judge could. And so this is kind of a call out to those in literary studies and film studies uh, to the extent uh, that you find audiences that are broader than what, to, what I'll get as a law professor to uh, find some inspiration and some hope and some guidance and some uh, possibilities uh, in this. Of course, she's speaking to an audience that might be different than the audience that you speak to, and that's good, right? We need to be speaking to different audiences, but she's got an audience. This one, uh, I think it was a National Book Award uh, for uh, what, what she did here, and so it caught, I think, the public's imagination, and, and, and we have to look at this in the light of missing and murdered women and uh, girls, um, because this was written at that moment, and her and Louise was was very aware, and of course, participating in this. I was very aware, writing about this and participating in this. Um, th think about Wendigos as more than just people that are hungry for food; that they they're never satisfied with their sexual appetites. Or think about uh, what's happening with um, Standing Rock or other places where we're not satisfied with what we draw out of the ground or take off the earth. We always want more. So that Wendigos are not just individuals that might want to eat too much. Wendigos come in many different shapes and forms in our contemporary society. And so if we look to see these Wendigos in that broader setting, then these legal principles uh, suddenly jump off the page away from 1838. And they, they're just, they circulate right now because I know that we could identify people like uh, this uh, situation in the book here, 
uh, or the situation that I read to you in the story or what Hadley started to collect and look at how Anishinaabe or Indigenous law could be thought about to address not just our criminal justice issues, but our environmental issues, the issues around uh, the, 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 the loss, the waste, the consumptive aspect of what's happening with uh, um, uh, Indigenous women and girls, as the, the inquiry uh, pointed out very strongly. So um, questions, comments, uh, engagement, I really welcome any uh, dimension that you want to pick up here. Uh, we've got about half an hour. Yes, Karen. Hi. Um, um, this is a, a real pleasure for me because I teach this book in many of my classes and I'm teaching it at, or, you know, the students and I are teaching it to ourselves at the end of the term. So yes. um, uh, one, of, one of the reasons I like it is for the reason you just pointed out, it's, it's, it, it's so pedagog pedagog pedagogical, right? Um, so, you know, you learn a lot about the way that the law works as a kind of impasse to, to real justice. Um, and, uh, uh, and it does it in an, an extraordinarily imaginative and sympathetic way. Um, um, but, you know, one of the, one of the uh, I guess, questions I, I have in, in teaching it and maybe writing about it someday is um, to what extent the Wendigo figure is expandable you you seem to be looking at it as a you know an ex, an, a figure that you can see in variety of domains like domestic abuse or um, sexual violence or you know the greed for oil um, and um, you know one of the implications you know this is from a literary standpoint of the condensation that goes on in the novel is that the kind of windigos that we're getting uh, we're getting introduced to tend to be on the settler side uh, in relationship to um, you know the the you know the 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 family of the narrator and um, among others um, and so I'm just curious what would be if there's something at stake or something that is you know, ethically questionable about using the concept to talk about relations not only between settlers and indigenous groups or individuals, but within settler communities as well. Like if you were to use this concept to talk about something like um, sexual violence, you yes. know, like could Bill Clinton be a Wendigo, right? With the sex addict or Trump mm -hmm. be a Wendigo, that mm -hmm. would be that would be one of my questions. And then in, in that case, you know, I was very surprised to see, you know, the sort of almost therapeutic layers that were possible in mediating the situation. And, um, yeah. and it just seems like certain people don't deserve that. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, well, it's a great, it's a great question. And I, I, I said this yesterday, but I think the answer is it depends uh, because different communities have different interpretive rules and different scope for how they might take this story and travel it to other places. Um, I, I remember teaching uh, stories um, on the land at Cape Croker and learning from Basil Johnson that I could tell stories all year long and he was very insistent about that. But I can remember going to um, uh, Chippewa of the Deshkeng, uh, the Thames Chippewa, just south of London, Ontario. And uh, they didn't tell stories uh, that uh, I did after the frog started singing. And so one community says, no, this is the scope of the story, time and place and manner restrictions. Another story says, no, this is, this is more open. And there's no authoritative final arbiter that we can go to, to answer that question. Um, and so we're just gonna be in conflict with one another between one community and another community, we have to live in accordance with the teachings that we've received and then recognize and respect what others uh, might say are limits to how these stories could travel. 
Having said that, again, Basil writes about Wendigos. He wrote about Wendigos. He's now passed. Um, he was I. He was my my mentor and teacher, and um, he he wrote about Wendigos very explicitly, not just being individuals, but being corporations, uh, being powerful politicians, uh, indigenous and non-indigenous, and so he called for that kind of a an application. And, uh, and then the, the therapeutic nature that's there is the idea that um, people might on the face of it not look like they deserve it, uh, but Anishinaabe law is not just retributive. It does have retributive elements, definitely so, uh, but it's more nuanced than that. And there are times when it's about creating relationality that looks at the possibility of, of renovation or reconnection or whatever the word is that you would want to use. And again, whether or not you think that person deserves that label, deserves that um, <laughs> kind of care is, is gonna be community and um, uh, individually contextualized. But for some uh, Anishinaabe people, definitely so. Um, they would have the story travel all those distances um, that some might not want to in other settings. I saw Rob there uh, um, unmuting. Yeah, um, <clears throat> I, I have a question. I mean, it stri strikes me that um, one of the things uh, in the article, Chris shared some articles with us before to contextualize um, the novel and, and in, in the conversations we've been having this week, as well as Karen and your question, there's something about the um, juris the jurisdictional or, or the boundaries of um, say, you know, can this term travel in different contexts? What is the, the location of um, the sort of power of certain legal authorities um, in certain locations and whether those locations, you know, are, are disciplinary in the sense of um, the literary studies or the poetic or law. Um, I'm thinking about movement and, and the way you so helpfully phrased it for me, that conjugation. But I'm wondering about the, how you think about metaphor because um, sort of so me metaphor or differently allegory, which would be these terms that are foundational to my training at least in English literary studies, but are resisted, I know, by um, different, like that sort of now normative decolonization is not a metaphor um, argument, as well as um, knowledge holders and folks that I know here in Treaty 6 territory resisting imagination um, as a kind of concept. So I'll, I'll get to the point, sorry, I'm, I'm going on, but um, how do you think about metaphor in relation to interpretation and drawing out law from story? Um, because I think it met, to what extent is metaphor a helpful way of thinking about the way terms travel and to what extent is it diminishing of the way the poetic is kind of relegated in Western thought, and, and as Chris saying, like racialized in Western thought, as Kant said, you know, we have to clip the wings of imagination in order to get it at order. Um, I really that, appreciate that background because I don't know how you might use the concepts of metaphor and allegory in literary studies. And so it's helpful for me to get that sense um, let me say a few things. One is I quite take some delight in Indigenous law being applied to non-Indigenous peoples since for 500 years the shoe's been on the other foot and we've had to be dispossessed uh, by that occurring. So, wow, 
the mobility and the traveling in the other direction um, is, is a liberation in, uh, an, in, in a certain respect. And so let's, uh, let's think about that. And then um, I think I would not want to clip the wings of imagination or metaphor or allegory in relationship to law. Of course, law has a liter literal uh, dimension where there's a, a decision that's made that has a practical application in a, the life of an individual whose liberty might be constrained or someone who has to be fined or you know, a jurisdiction is uh, held so that someone can't cross that. Um, so I, I do not want to lose sight of making sure that at certain moments we do clip the wings of imagination so that we are able to focus on uh, what is before us. But I wouldn't see it as an either or. I would see it as an and. Um, and again, that's a little bit like the thesis in my book, Freedom and Indigenous Constitutionalism. Um, let's bob and weave and be free and find places for applying different um, frames, different approaches, different disciplines, different methodologies, different pedagogies as appropriate. And, and, uh, and so then thinking about the, the beauty, well, it is um, my, my colleague Dar Darcy Lindbergh, Lindbergh, who you heard from the other day, wrote an article called Beautiful Creeness, which is trying to think about the aesthetics of being Cree in relationship to law and what that brings uh, to the work. Um, I think that uh, metaphor is very important in Anishinaabe uh, um, rhetorics or speech or storytelling because we need ambiguity. Ambiguity is very, very important to Anishinaabe uh, legal and political and social order in my view. Um, there was a Mary Black, Black Rogers who is a, someone who is non-Indigenous who studied about Anishinaabe people in the 1960s and she identified precept ambiguity or percept ambiguity as, uh, as being very, very um, important understanding who Anishinaabe people are. Why ambiguity? Uh, because it allows a freedom. It allows a, a play. It allows uh, a possibility. It, it facilitates agency. It doesn't lock you down. It's, it's a conjugation again, right? It allows for a continuing adding or subtracting of suffixes and prefixes as the case uh, might require. Um, and so to practice law with ambiguity in the Western construct is to really not do your job because you want to clip as much as possible that ambiguity away to be clear and concise as to what your reasons for judgment are or coming to some um, uh, process. But um, ambiguity is just treasured in my view. And, and, and ambiguity is there when you speak metaphor, uh, when you speak allegory, um, because other people can then participate more fully. Because you can come in with your views and another person can come in with their views and another person's over here with their views and you counsel together about the range of, of possibilities that might exist there. And that invites participation as opposed to saying, I'm the expert as the judge, I've got the authoritative interpretation here. I, could, I properly clipped all our imagination so that this is what we're doing. Um, it's no like it's, it's trying to say that might be appropriate for a certain part of what we're doing. Uh, but it's not the only part of what we're doing because we really, at the end of the day, value the participation and the, the horiz is that it right? The horizontal, as opposed to the vertical imposition, and uh, and and if we if we can find that, um, then uh, we do. It. When I when I talk to my mother, I I sometimes hardly understand what she says because it's just wrapped in metaphor upon metaphor upon metaphor. And when I look at the old treaty speeches from those uh, wampum belts that I shared, people are talking about birds and rivers and sun and grass. And of course, they're also talking about their hoped for relationships with those on the other side of the treaty engagement. Uh, but they were trying to open up things uh, as well as create pathways for, for working together. So, just some thoughts, and again, we might have such disciplinary, pers different disciplinary perspectives that you know, we, could, we should probably continue to learn from one another about uh, what Kant is doing and what Anishinaabe people are doing, and what the courts are doing. Thanks.
Chelsea. Hi. Um, so I have a character-based question for you about this text. I recently read it for the first time and sorry, my cats are going to be loud. Um, reading about so Lark as the Wendigo, but then also knowing that he's a twin. And so I'm just wondering if the cannibalistic nature, the nature for always being hungry, destructive, that's not an innate trait that a character should be born with, right? Because we're also getting this story about the lesson of coherence of family and the importance of um, families being together and what happens when families are not together, especially with these two twins. But we have one that, like his sister Linda, comes out completely different um, than he is. So I'm just wondering if yes, the nature is perhaps like an infectious disease yeah. rather than an innate trait born to a person. Yeah, so, you know, we often hear this genetics is not destiny. You know, if you have a DNA um, that uh, tends you towards a certain um, susceptibility to something, um, that doesn't necessarily mean that that susceptibility will be realized because there's so many other factors that are present. And I, I'd like to think about what uh, Louisa is doing in this book and also what Anishinaabe uh, thought is trying to transmit is that we all have the possibility or the, the potential to become Windigo, um, but it's not necessarily so. Um, we carry that around with us, but it might not manifest itself. It um, might not uh, be really, at the end of the day, who we are, although it's not, um, it's not like completely other uh, to find that even within ourselves, there might be something that that's consumptive. So I might not be a, a cannibal when it comes to this thing. Um, and I might never be in other areas of my life either, but I might not be in this thing, but I might be in this thing, right? So there, there's, a, there's an opportunity to take it up in that regard. But then I think we also have to correlate these, this character with the trickster character. Like there's something similar there. We are all Nana Bojo or Wasika Jack, uh, or Badger, or Coyote, or Old Man, or Crow. Um, that is, um, we all find these places where we can be simultaneously kind and um, cunning and, and helpful and harmful, uh, sometimes in the same moment. And, and these characters are a call to understand that we're never fully integral. We're never sort of fully um, oh, just let's relax now because we know who we are. Uh, we've got this. It's always a work in progress with these different forces that run around in our lives. And it doesn't mean it's necessarily so, right? We're influenced by our environment as the, the two characters show there, the, the brother and the sister. Uh, they're influenced by their choices uh, along the way. They're influenced by what the teachings are that they receive and how the people interact with them in terms of kindness or or stinginess, um, and you see that in the, the characters uh, that are brother and sister here. And I just think that, again, is so well done by uh, Louise um, to, to, to find uh, those uh, subtleties uh, present here, and yet at the same time communicate something about our own ambiguity as, as uh, human beings. Like we, we, don't, we, don't ha we don't got this, right? We just never quite know how I'm gonna show up uh, tomorrow or five years down the road, we can, we can be somewhat confident that we're not going to do that because of the choices we made, the environment, the education, uh, the, the, the love or lack thereof that we've received. Right? We, we, can, we can walk without feeling like we're always looking over our shoulder, um, but there's a real caution at the same time, like don't get carried away with that. Um, you, you're you're um, more complicated than that. You know, that statement, I am multitudes kind of thing, uh, could be a part of uh, what uh, Anishinaabe thought might say on this. And I think that's what um, um, Louise may be trying to get up, but I don't know. And I like to say, I don't know. <laughs> Ambiguity.
I'm happy to stay in the background, but I will speak to keep the ball in the air. Sure. Um, yeah, it's a very ambiguous novel. Um, it takes up the classic Freudian motif of the uncanny double, but reorients the Freudian model around the mother rather than the father, even though there is a castrated priest who watches horror stories and restages the scene from E.T.A. Hoffman's um, The Sandman. And the priest who also gives this incredible speech on theodicy, saying God, right, he gives this Catholic speech about how God finds something good from every evil. Yes. Just the ways of God to man, but the novel doesn't go that way, does it? Mm -hmm. Just curious, when, you know, I've been teaching this text for years in a course I call Indigenous Horror, um, and I'm always fascinated by the way students react to the figure of Lyndon Lark, the villain. And it doesn't seem to be the way the novel reacts. So I wonder if you could say more about this tension between retribution and restoration. Because it seems very clear to many students that what happens to Lyndon, he's killed, is the right decision. But that's not where the novel ends. And I often feel after reading it, you know, and after studying indigenous literature for many years, I feel like I'm kind of tone deaf, but certain messages are finally getting through to me, which is the, the Western European culture is very severe and Western European just, justice is very severe. A mixture of sanctimony and sadism. Um, what do you make of, <laughs> it's hard to discuss because of course you're trying not to give anything away, but what do you make of this tension between retribution and restoration in the novel? And is there a trap for the reader there? It seems to me that every character in the novel, every major character has a wing to go moment. Yes. Go temptation. I really like that you bring that forward in that way because I think it advances that thesis I was giving a second ago about ambiguity, um, that uh, each, each character is trapped in ambiguity. Um, there are certain resolutions and those resolutions um, you know, have consequences that for most of them enable them to get on with their life, except for the person, um, you know, that's the, the villain in the story. Um, and, and that uh, even there is, um, you know, there's some sympathy, at least that I have for that character because of the way that they received um, their so-called care uh, from uh, parents and, and being separated from that which um, should be connected. Um, and I, I think that uh, there's, there's, there's redemption and there's um, restoration and there's retribution that just runs through every character. And, and to not let us be settled in relationship to anyone um, keeps the story alive, right? It, it, it means that uh, it, it lives with the possibilities of interpretation within the corners of the book, but then as we take it elsewhere, it gets alive and we can continue to wonder about it and, um, and then think about the applications as, as we're doing here. And, and so I, I quite appreciate that. Um, that's a good question. I'll, I'll just share the screen for a second uh, once more to let you see that these are cases that come before the Canadian courts. Um, here's a case called uh, The Queen versus uh, Maji K. Kwanabe, um, 1897. Um, there's a windigo in the area. He's said to be desiring to do others harm. There's guards that are placed around the village. The windigo is there, chased, challenged. Um, no answer, guns fired, and then the person that shot the um, uh, person uh, was the foster father. The question is, is this manslaughter or is there a defense of mistake? And the court says it's manslaughter uh, because um, the pagans, and they, I, I could actually quote from the decision here, um, it appears from the evidence that the prisoner was a member of a tribe of pagan Indians who believed in the existence of an evil spirit clothed in human flesh, or in human form called a windigo, which would eat a human being. Um, so it's taking up what's going on here, not as law, not as governance, uh, but taking it up as kind of this 
religious or spiritual or, or psychosis and uh, not being able to give an excuse for that. Um, and of course, there's consequences that flow from that. And then in 1997, there was a case out of the Ontario General uh, Divisional Court, uh, the Queen versus Jacko, someone accused of being a bear walker um, who was very strong and powerful and threatening and uh, weak and shy, small person in stature, uh, eventually uh, killed this person. And the question was whether or not the killing of this powerful person by this weaker person was self-defense or intentional killing beyond a reasonable doubt. And in this case, the court found it was, um, it was a doubt as to whether or not it was self-defense or intentional killing. And that whenever there's a doubt in a murder trial, you give the lower um, 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 reading. And so there's the self-defense charge here sticks and the person's not, uh, uh, not found guilty of the, the murder uh, because of the self-defense. Uh, the point I'm making here um, is that these cases still come before us in that narrower way about individuals and how they might react in particular instances. And so let's not lose sight of that as we're talking about the other ways that this book uh, travels. It's a, it's a, it's a powerful book because he's, he's got these tribal court cases that he pulls, that she pulls out, sorry. I'm talking about the judge Coots, but I mean, <laughs> Louise is um, speaking uh, as the judge in those uh, settings. We're just about through time here, but if there's a final question or two, I would certainly welcome that. And if there's uh, silence, that's fine too. Can I just say, um, I used to teach this book alongside um, Three Day Road, and that's a powerful, powerful Wendigo story as well that goes to, I think, what Karen was asking about. What if the Wendigo is within um, the Indigenous community, uh, as opposed to, in this case, being the non-Indigenous person or the corporation or the, um, you know, whatever the case may be. And I, I, you know, we can say what we will about uh, Joseph Boyden, uh, but he was able to tell a very powerful uh, story that has resonance with um, the story I told you at the beginning, the story that we read here, uh, but placed in sort of 1914 to 18 in the middle of a war and uh, what's going on at that time. Uh, and then, so, you know, I, I appreciate that Christopher's teaching this, this course on um, horror. I've, I've taught whole courses in law and literature trying to find resources for reasoning that come out of Anishinaabe ways of understanding conflict and dealing with conflict. And so we don't just have to read other cases uh, to find these resources. We can read other stories and hear other experiences. Great, well, I think we can probably wrap there if there are no further comments, because of course, John, you now have to go teach a course and come back in the evening in this kind of split shift. <laughs> so, um, that was a remarkable discussion and a remarkable presentation. And if you haven't read the novel yet, though, of course, I know everyone has, um, I think it really come to value um, the past hour that you just spent because it really takes you to the core of the novel, I think. And that endless ambiguity, absolutely. It makes that novel endlessly readable, yeah. right? It was, I'll never tire of going back to that novel and learning something new and learning how I'm clouded by my own assumptions and prejudices constantly. So thanks again, John, and thanks for everyone for coming out. Um, our next event will be tonight at 6.30 Mountain Time. And of course, you can access that through the EFS website. So, this will sign off and let you go. See you all later. Bye. Bye.